All right. I think we're going to get started here pretty much on time. I'm just letting a few more people in from our waiting room. Okay. There we go. And we're just about there. All right, so I think we're going to get started right on time here. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is, again, the 25th workshop of the Agricultural Genome to Phenome Initiative, or AG2PI. AG2PI is funded by USDA NIFA. This is session two um, of Scientific Computing and Data Analytics, a comprehensive toolkit for research. Um, a recording of today's session uh, will be made available on the AGTPI website, agtpi.org, um, when everything is done by tomorrow morning, um, probably at the latest. You will also find a recording of yesterday's session, session number one. And um, we also have other recordings there as well. If you are not previously familiar with us, we have virtual field days or other 24 workshops um, and some conference videos as well. So to get us started, I'd like to introduce Emmanuel Gonzalez. He is a PhD candidate in Dr. Duke Pauley's lab at the University of Arizona. His work focuses on leveraging plant phenomics, data science, and machine learning to investigate how crops respond to both abiotic and biotic stress. Um, before I hand it over to Emmanuel, I would like to ask you to please fill out the survey at the end of the session when you exit Zoom. If you have questions, please put them in chat. And if you are on YouTube right now, and have questions, go ahead and put those in the comments, the questions section as well. Um, we are monitoring that and we will try to ask, um, answer those questions um, if there is, is time permitting. So Emmanuel, go ahead and take it. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. And I'd like to start off by thanking AG2PI for hosting our workshop today. So to get started, I just wanted to give a brief introduction uh, to our team. So we are comprised of graduate students, engineers, and undergraduate students as well uh, from the Pauli Lab. So this is Dr. Duke's Pauli's uh, lab here at the University of Arizona. And as Nicole alluded to, we study uh, plants, uh, specifically about stress responses under field conditions here in uh, Arizona. Now, yesterday we talked about fundamental computational toolkit. We went through the basics of data science, uh, the fundamentals of Python programming, and today we'll be moving on to session number two. In this session, we will be covering uh, machine learning as well as data visualization. So let's go ahead and just talk briefly about machine learning in scientific computing and what that looks like. So we talked about yesterday, uh, you know, this increase in data that is known as big data. Uh, in science, there are many fields that are generating data, collecting data, trying to analyze data, and all this really necessitates new tools such as machine learning. Machine learning is vital in both of these processes within the data life cycle, particularly the processing phase as well as the analysis phase. Now, you might be wondering, well, how does this data life cycle actually begin? Well, let's take a closer look at the field of plant science. Uh, in the field of plant science, there are many options to collect data. So for example, we might have robotic platforms that collect uh, data on plants. We might have some carts that are able to, uh, you know, be more mobile and move around a field and go to different fields and collect data on a variety of different crops. We may also fly drones over our fields. Um, you know, we might be interested in the thermal uh, canopy temperature, for example, or multispectral data. And lastly, we might have phones that are also collecting uh, some information such as diseases, or perhaps that's where you take notes on your field observations. Now, all of this data, um, you know, is collected, but then you have to actually extract information from that. And this is where machine learning comes into play. 
machine learning allows us to extract uh, insights from data. So for example, if we start at the base of the pyramid uh, using one of those platforms that I mentioned, such as a robotic platform, uh, we then want to move that data up into the information realm. And in order to do that, we might use machine learning and lastly, we might also want to take that information into the knowledge phase and the wisdom phase. And along all of these levels here, uh, you know, machine learning is quite helpful in allowing us to do that. The reason why is because machine learning is able to extract information from data without being specifically told how uh, to do so in programming languages, for example. So for the purposes of this session, we will be focusing on uh, this particular uh, step here, which is the data to information phase. How do we actually take data and how do we extract information from it, particularly using uh, machine learning? Now let's take a closer look at a case study uh, showing how machine learning might be used in this process. So up at the top here, we're looking at uh, you know, a usual processing phase where we might detect a plant. We might then want to segment that plant, remove the soil, for example, and leave only the plant itself. We might also want to segment individual leaves, for example. And lastly, once we have individual uh, uh, subjects, we might want to then extract some phenotypes. So for example, we might do some organ phenotyping. Here's a leaf. We might want to study the length of that leaf, the width, the angle. Um, and in addition to that, we might also be interested in whole plant phenotyping, where we take the whole plant that we segmented, and we might be interested in extracting the volume. Uh, perhaps you're interested in the bounding volume itself. And all of these traits could be used to identify, for example, genes that are associated with some sort of beneficial uh, stress response. Now, in all of these steps, machine learning is quite vital. Machine learning can be used in detection, it can be used in the segmentation phase, and even in this phenotyping phase as well. And this is because it allows us to, like I mentioned, extract these insights without having to actually write the computational code uh, to do these tasks. You might just take some data and train the model in how to detect individual plants, how to segment uh, those points, and finally, how to phenotype that information. Now, together with machine learning, here is where um, a lot of the previous topics that we talked about factor in. So machine learning needs a high performance computer or some other type of cloud computing platform in order to run efficiently. We might also need to be very familiar with Python, R, or any other programming language in order to really leverage machine learning. And finally, GitHub in order to document and be able to share with our collaborators our machine learning uh, workflow. Now, in addition to machine learning, we will also be talking about interactive data visualization. So I wanted to just briefly mention what we mean by interactive data visualization and why it is important. So here we're looking at a, uh, an animation showing an interactive visualization where we are able to zoom into specific data points. We can remove specific groups from the visualization. And this really allows us to interrogate and, and really dig deeper into our data uh, more so than we would be able to in, any, in a non-interactive format. So this really allows us to zoom in, perhaps identify outliers, uh, and remove specific groups that we might not be interested in. So this really gives us flexibility in our exploratory data analysis phase, where we're really able to begin to identify patterns within our data. Now, in addition to interactive visualizations, we might also want to um, do some visualizations on the geospatial uh, side as well. So this here is showing um, all of our detections coming from thermal imagery. So this here is a thermal image, and each one of these red boxes represents an individual plant that was detected. Now, once we identify that individual plant, we can then extract the canopy temperature at the individual plant scale. So here, each one of these red boxes would have a canopy temperature associated with it. And we can then plot that in a map uh, to show us trends over time. 
So here we're looking at an animation that's uh, progressing over time. And this is multiple scans that were conducted over the course of a growing season of sorghum. So we can see over time that the canopy temperature depression is changing. And as the temperatures increase here in Arizona, we get a much greater difference between uh, our two treatments. So up here, we have uh, our water limited phase. And then down here, we have our well water treatment. So this here really highlights how we can leverage not only interactive visualizations, but also geospatial visualizations in order to conduct our research. Now, before we get started with our sessions, I want to remind everyone that uh, we do have some workshop materials that we want everyone to have access to. Uh, these contain our workshop overview, learning objectives, and all of the code associated with our different uh, sessions. So here is the link uh, to that document, and I will go ahead and put this in the chat for you as well. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions throughout our sessions, please feel free to put them here in the Zoom chat. And if you are on YouTube, uh, please feel free uh, to put your questions into the comment section there, and we will do our best to get those answered. Okay, so with that, I will go ahead and now pass it over to Bella, who will start off our first session. All righty. Hello, everyone. Um, a percent. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the introduction to machine learning today. So who am I? My name is Bella. Um, I'm majoring in math and computer science and I'm minoring in statistics and biology at the University of Arizona. And I've been working with the Pauli lab for about a year now. And one of the things I do as a researcher is I'm working on a project to study late season lettuce growth based on their performance early in the growing cycle using a long short term memory model. And we'll talk more about the types of model later. So a little bit about my session. Today we're going to go over the basic principles of machine learning and how to implement them. We're going to go over the types of machine learning models and we're going to do a machine learning example in Python. And if you have any questions at any time, you can put them in the chat for the rest of the team to answer. So let's start off with what is machine learning? It seems like you hear about it every day in the news. So what is it at its core? So it's pretty simple. It's actually just applied statistics and computing. And it allows machines to imitate the way we as humans process information and make decisions. It's used for computer visualization, image recognition, language processing, and more. And our ultimate goal is just to give some data and parameters to our program and end up with a useful prediction. So I'm sure we've had a similar experience in our academic careers. We're given a scatter plot full of points and we're told to just make a best fit line. So maybe you look at it and you think, hmm, maybe the first point is kind of low, but the last point is kind of high. So you kind of just put it somewhere in the middle. So that's what machine learning does, but with precise statistics. So what are the components of machine learning? So first, of course, you have to collect your data and you need to collect a lot of sufficient data and make sure your data is clean. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then you need to split your data. You need to split it into testing and training. And then you're going to train your model on your training sets. And you also need to select the correct type of model for your type of data and task. And then finally, you're going to evaluate your model using statistical measures. So then what are some different machine learning models? So you can use different machine learning models to analyze different data types, such as image data, 3D data, and more. We will primarily focus on numerical data for our example later on. And um, so the simplest type of model is linear regression. It just assumes the data is linear and predicts outcomes based on a best fit line, like I was talking about a moment ago. And then on the other side of the spectrum is neural networks, which are the most complex. They rely on intricate pieces of computer software that closely resemble human neurons. But at their core, both of these do the same thing. They try and find patterns in our data for us. So what are some models we can implement right now? 
So first off, linear regression is often used for simpler predictions based on one set of observations. And then we have partial least squares regression, which is used for complex data that can be hyperspectral with many types of input. Random forest regression is used for predicting future cost and things like that. It's often used for numerical data. And finally, we're going to do a classification, classification model, which is k-means, and that's going to be used to show similarities between groups using multiple features. So let's go ahead and move to the notebook. Alrighty, so here I have a Jupyter notebook. Um, I think someone is going to send the link in the chat. So here's my Jupyter notebook. And I have imported a bunch of functions. Um, I don't know if you guys were here yesterday for the workshop, um, but when Emily was talking about imports, this is what you need to import to do machine learning. It looks like a lot right now, but they're very useful. So after I import everything I need to do, the machine learning models, I set a destination URL for my data. So this is, again, going back to one of the benefits of having cybers for your data. I can just give this Jupyter notebook with this URL, and I don't have to send any files over to my collaborators. And then I have made a list of column names just to kind of have them for our data. And here we're going to read the CSV from this link. And we're going to put it in a data frame called data. And here you can see um, what our data looks like. So we have a bunch of different variables about penguins. We have species, island, a bunch of measurements, stuff like that. Um, so we can take a closer look at our data. Um, so let's do data.head. Let's just take a look at our original data. So as you can see, head prints the first five lines of our data. So you can see it's this species, this island, and all these fun facts about their flippers. And then you can also do data.tail, which allows us to see the end there. Um, so one important thing when you're getting your data and processing your data for machine learning, um, if you notice these data points here, these are not a number, which is really bad for machine learning. We need, we need them to be a number and not, not a number. So one way that we can do that is by putting in the data equals data dot drop in A. And then we're going to print data again and see what it looks like. So here you can see that those not a numbers are just gone. So this just dropped the entire row for any one of them that had. Um, that kind of data point. So we can also make a little plot of our data to kind of see which features might be correlated. So we'll talk more about this later, but for now, this is just plotting each of the features against each other. So for example, this little chart right here is going to be flipper length versus Coleman length. And you can see the body mass up here dependent on flipper length as well. Um, so this can be used to kind of inform what you might want to build your model on. So looking at it, I'm thinking these look kind of linearly correlated, the body mass and the flipper length. So let's try and train a model on that. Well, first we need to get just one species because I don't really want to deal with all that variance that might come from having different species. And I'm just, I'm really interested in the Gen 2 species. So that's what this does right here. It's taking our data frame and it's saying we only want the data points where the species is Gen 2. And then again, we're just taking this data and we're saying we only want these two columns. And as you can see here, we end up getting the head of our data, the first five points. Um, you end up getting flipper length and body mass. So now that we have the kind of simplified data with all numbers, we're going to go down here and we are going to code through splitting our training and testing data together. So the first thing we're going to do is create NumPy arrays for our two variables here. And I'm going to say I want this one to come from flipper length 
in millimeters. And one important thing that you need to do with scikit-learn is doing dot reshape here. And this just makes sure that um, scikit-learn knows that you have just a one dimensional array because it can kind of get a little finicky with using the NumPy arrays. So if you do dot reshape, it knows that it's just basically just a list. And then again, we're gonna do that for body mass. And then dot reshape again. All right, so now that we have our data in these two handy arrays, we're going to split up our data. And luckily, scikit-learn, which is one of the libraries that we um, imported earlier, gives us something to do that. It's called train test split. It's a function. So all you need to do is create four names for what you want to name um, your training and testing data. So these are going to be my four names. And then you just do train test split. And then I'm going to do my x values, which is going to be flipper, and then body mass, which is going to be my y value. And I'm going to say test size equals 0.25. So as you can see, we just have this function that we imported up here, right here, from sklearn model selection. So that allows us to train our data and to, to split our training and test data without having to do a bunch of algorithms for it. So we just call that function. And we can take a look at one of the lists it puts out. And as you can see, it's just a list of values. Um, but it took 75% of our data and put it in the training data and the other 25 is in our testing data. So now that we have our data split up, we can create a model and fit it to our data. So all that we need to do for that is create a model by creating a variable and using the scikit-learn linear regression. So this is going to be our model. Um, and then we're going to fit our model on our data. So again, you can see we chose linear regression and then we said to our linear regression model, we wanna fit these data points. So now we can create a prediction based on our testing data. And then we can also print our predictions and see what that outputs. So these are our predicted values, um, but just as a list, they're not super helpful. We can see that it thinks that the body mass in grams of some of them are gonna be 4,619. 4, some of them it's gonna be more in the 5,000s we don't really gain any insights from this. So here we can create a graph to analyze the results of our model. So what this is saying is take our data, our testing data and plot it against what the Y value should be because we know what the Y value should be because we had the data all to begin with. So we can plot that in black and then we're going to put the linear regression model on top of that. So that's what this does by plotting the test and then our predictions. So as you can see, this isn't the best best fit line. Um, we have a lot of data points that are kind of really far outside of what was predicted. Um, so we can, one of the things that we can do is we can go up way up here and we can change the testing size. So this really just changes changes the proportion of the data that you're going to use for training and testing. Um, so the standard is typically 80-20. So let's try the standard and see what that does. So as you can see, we have a different line, but it's still not great. Um, so another thing that we can try is using other models. So again, down here, 
Um, this is a pre-processing step to make sure that scikit-learn knows that it's one-dimensional and processed in the right way for a random forest regressor, regressor. So we are going to do random forest regression by creating the model right here and then fitting the model against our training data and then again getting our predictions by predicting the test data. And then again, we're going to do that with PLS regression. And then we're going to fit the data and predict the data. So let's run that. And this is just a little snippet of code that creates a legend for our um, data visualization in a moment. So this is an interesting plot. We now have plotted the linear predictions, the PLS predictions, and the random forest regression predictions. So as you can see, linear and PLS look pretty much the same here. And that's because in this case, PLS um, uses the same kind of math that the linear regression does in Python for scikit-learn because they're both using partial least squares. So they look pretty similar because we're just using one data point in both situations. So you can see that random forest regression gave us a little bit more variance. And it might be better for some of the points, but it could be a lot worse for others. So how do we quantify that? So we can analyze our output using the scikit-learn function mean squared error. So it's kind of an, an average of the distance away from expected that each point is. So we get all three of those. And yeah, it looks like um, ultimately you want these to be zero. So it looks like random forest regression did the best in this case. But again, you can add more features and that should improve your predictions. All right, so we did regression. And another thing that you can do with machine learning is called classification. So you can ask it kind of what groups should this data belong to? So if we go back to our data visualization up here, we can see that these are pretty pretty far separated by species. So you can kind of see there's a few distinct groups up here that the data is really in three groups based on the species. And that is because of the way we classify species. But we can also make machine learning tell us what species each of these penguins should be based on this input data. So we can scroll down. And down here, we're going to add from sklearn.cluster import k-means. So this is going to be the k-means classification that I was talking about earlier. And it's really important to make sure you import everything that you need because it's easy to forget. And later on, it will tell you that you don't have your function when you think that you should. So I'm going to choose the features for this. And I'm going to choose flipper length. and then Coleman length. And then I'm going to choose my X data. I'm going to choose just these features from the original data. And then my Y data is going to be the species. So now again, we're going to split our testing and training data. So we're going to do X train x test, y train, y test. We're going to do train test split on x data and y data. And I'm going to say test size equals 0 0.2. And so now, one thing that's important about classification, um, we need to normalize our data um, this depends on the type of data that you have and kind of like the variance of your data, um, but we're going to try it both ways and see what we get. So extreme normalize. And we have our scikit-learn pre-processing library here that this function is coming from. We're going to say normalize extreme. And then we're going to say the same thing with our testing data. OK, 
Okay, so now that we have our normalized data, we can train a clustering model on it. So a cluster model is basically going to group these points together based on their physical distance. So we're going to say k means, and we're going to say n clusters equals three, because we know that we have three species here. Um, it gets a little more complicated if you aren't sure how many clusters that you would like. So now that we've created our model, we need to train our model. So we're going to say cluster model dot fit x train normalized. Okay, so now we have a fitted model. And then this um, little snippet of code is going to um, convert all the numbers that we output into um, strings. So basically what a cluster model does is it will number each of the clusters for us. So in this case, we'll have 0, 1, and 2. But for the purposes of um, creating a graph of our data, I would like these to be strings. So I'm just going to cast each one for x in cluster model dot labels. So that list of that labels right there, again, is just a list of labels. And it's just going to say 0, 1, or 2 in this case. So we can create a scatter plot with Plotly. We're going to do scatter x train normalized. And then flipper length. And then color equals string labels. Oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, so one thing that's interesting about when you normalize your data, um, it actually creates just a two dimensional array. So for the purposes of printing for creating our graph, I'm going to retrain it on just the training data without normalizing it. Okay, so here we have this little graph that kind of shows us where it thinks that our species should be divided. So it thinks this should be species one, this green area should be species zero, and this purple should be species two. So how do we compare that to our actual species data that we ended up having from our data set? So what we can do is add code here, npx.scatter. We're going to use data. We're going to do Coleman link. And we're going to do flipper link. And then color based on the species. So the colors are a little bit shuffled here um, because it kind of randomly decides what color to make each one. So you can see that Adelie is down here in the purple and the kind of um, similar group up here is also purple down in the low corner over here. And then again, we have our upper group up here for Gen 2. That's kind of the green down here. And then up here, it's put that in red. So it did a pretty good job of clustering these groups, um, but that is what our test our tr testing data is for. So um, before you have your finalized model, you can keep trying different inputs based on purely the training data, and then you'll get a better result. Um, so again, I can change the test size, stuff like that. Yeah, and you can kind of see it gave us a little bit different groups, but not really. Um, so one important thing about classification is actually, if you noticed, I only trained it on the X training data, which was our two dimensional features NumPy array. So what that really tells it is we don't want to give it any like Y value. We just say put this data into three groups based on these two features. So it doesn't know like what the Y data was for these values. So it might have weighted one of these things differently than we actually do when classifying these species. So these bring up some important questions. And one of those questions is, um, let's 
So the models we implemented again are linear regression, partial least squares regression, random forest regression, and then a classification model. So how do we measure a model's success? So one important thing is a model success metric should really depend on the type of data you analyzed. So it really depends on us as the programmers, what we want the outcome to be. So a commonly used metric is the root mean square error, and it means the average distance of the predicted from the actual values. And the predictions from different models can be compared to determine which is the most successful, kind of like what we did with linear PLS and forest. So one thing that can happen with your model is overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting on one hand is the phenomenon where your model too closely resembles your training data. So that means when you have new data that you input, it can't properly extrapolate that information to new situations. So then on the other hand, underfitting is kind of the opposite. It just means a model that really doesn't describe its data very well. And both of these problems can be minimized by tuning your parameters and splitting up training and testing data in the correct proportions, which again is usually 80-20. And yeah, these are precisely why we even split up our data into testing and training sets. You might wonder why we don't just train a model on all the data that we have and then just input new data whenever we get a chance to get a prediction. Well, that's because we want to have the best model we possibly can before we bring it into new situations. And we do that by analyzing its performance on our testing set. So some models have extra inputs called hyperparameters, such as model depth, learning rate, and stuff like that. These are really um, commonly used in the neural networks that I was talking about earlier that can get really complicated with different parameters. Um, so in this case, you have a validation set. So you can actually seek out your best parameter before you expose your model to your testing set. Um, that's because if the model has seen your testing set, it can get um, biased because it already knows what its outcome should be. So you really need that extra set to make sure that you are tuning your parameters before, your have, before you have your finalized model. And in that case, you would split it 80, 10, 10. So that is kind of an overview of machine learning. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to Aditya to do some data visualization. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Aditya Kumar. I am a student, uh, senior at the University of Arizona. I'm studying computer science and I have a minor in statistics and data science. So in today's module, I'll be introducing to you the in, introducing to you interactive data visualization in Python using Plotly. Plotly is like a very uh, popular library used by Python developers for visualizing all kinds of data from 2D data to 3D data. So we are going to look at some of those plots that we can be creating using Plotly. I'll be going to the website to show you the plots that you can create with Plotly. But before that, I'll explain to you the basic outline of this module. For, so first, we are going to talk about the motivation for this module, as in why do you need to visualize data and why do you need to visualize it with, with Plotly? Then we are going to draw some basic visual charts like bar graphs and scatter plots that are used by everybody in all fields, irrespective of which what work they do. Then we're gonna talk about plant data visualization, which are some visuals that are centered towards plant scientists. So we're gonna making um, geospatial plots and we're gonna plotting, making a 3D plot for our, for one of our 3D sensors data. And finally, I'm, I have some references for you guys that you can use after this workshop to learn more about Plotly and, and its uh, contemporaries. So let us get started. Please ask any questions in chat if you have any doubts or anything, and we'll be happy to answer them. Okay. So why do we need visuals, you might be wondering. Why don't we have just tab tables for everything? like? They are pretty readable sometimes, but sometimes for lots of numerical data, they can be unreadable. 
and that they can be difficult to understand. So we need visuals to make data readable, understandable, and interesting. And but we also need to make sure that the visuals that we are creating can be uh, are good and suitable for the data. So that tells brings us to the question: What makes a good visualization? So a good visualization is informative, fun to look at, easy to recreate, appropriate, and most importantly, accurate. Also, it nowadays it also needs to be accessible because we want as many people as we can to access our data and learn from it. So here's a quick example that I think really illustrates the importance of good vis uh, visualizations. So let us go to this link. And okay, you mean collapse? So yeah. So here you on the screen, you can three, see three charts. One of them uh, is a good visualization. The other one's an average visualization or a bad visual. And the third one's the ugly one, the really bad one that you don't want to be creating for our data. It just shows us the time spent by five users on different social medias. And you can see the first one's pretty interesting and pretty clear to look at, pretty easy to understand because it uses vertical uh, vertical distances to show how much time is spent. There has been a lot of research to show that people are able, able to understand vertical, uh, vertical visuals more easily than area-based visuals like pie charts. So this one's pretty easy to understand, you can see. You can see that Billy spends a lot of time on Instagram, you can look at the key here, and lesser time on LinkedIn. The second one's not too bad, but you can see that second one, it shows connection where there's no re really no relation between two things. So you can see that there's a line joining the Billy, Billy's uh, and Johnny's um, Twitter usage, while there's not really a relation between them. So a line graph would be a bad chart, a bad chart for this kind of data. So, and an ugly chart would be a la chart like this, which also so shows relation while also showing, um, giving, adding an extra depth of complexity, extra complexity to the data. So it's adding area that makes it difficult to understand. It has changed the axes and that can be difficult to under, uh, understand for a user that's looking at the data for the first time. So when we visualize our data, it is important for us to kind of get to have a high level sense of it. See, and that would tell us what visuals to create for what kind of data. Okay. So you might be wondering then, okay, it's, we need to create visuals, that's good. We need to create good visuals, that's good. Then why do we want to create visuals with Plotly? So creating with visuals with Plotly, firstly, super easy, as you'll see the, down the road. It's very easy and they're quick and they're very easy to create and they are interactive. That is something that really brings a lot to the table. Like Emmanuel said in the introduction of the workshop, um, interactivity brings a lot to, uh, makes us create charts that can do a lot of things instead of having just an image of the graph. And we, I'll show you later now, later in the workshop, how, what kind of interactive interactivity you can be doing with plotty charts. And if you got to inter, um, create those charts from, from scratch, that would be pretty difficult because it would need a lot of code. Here's a quick example. So if you use vanilla Python, like Python with no external libraries except for tkinter, which is pretty much vanilla, it's just use, it's a graphic library for Python. If you use that, create a simple bar graph, you will need this much code. It's not a lot of complex code, but when you're tight on time, you don't really want to be writing all these lines. So that's why with Plotly, you can simply call the inbuilt functions in the library and create work, create bar graphs and any kind of plots you want very easily. So before I end the motivation section, let us go to the Plotly's website and take a look at some kind of visuals that you can be creating with the, with the data you have in hand. Okay, this is official Plotly uh, documentation. Uh, let me minimize this chat box. Okay, okay. so here you can see there are some fundamental charts that you can be creating, like basic charts, like scatter plots, line, uh, line charts, bar graphs, 
We are going to be creating bar charts and scatter plots in today's session. Now you can be creating some statistical phase, uh, special statistical specific uh, charts like violin charts, box plots that tell you a lot about the distribution out of data, what's the median, mean, values, all of those things used by a lot of lot of people in statistics. You can create scientific charts. We are not going to be creating those, but and financial charts, but we're going to be creating a map box, map plots. And those map plots are pretty useful for plant data because it helps you to um, get uh, to display geospatial data effectively. And we are also going to be creating 3D charts. So you can come to this website anytime you want, take a look at it. Their documentation is pretty good. So it will give you some idea based uh, on how to make charts and what charts to make. Okay, let's move on with the next section of the workshop. So basic visualization techniques. So for this session, we plan to be using the following libraries. One's the Plotly Express libraries and the other's the Pandas libraries. Plot Plotly Express library is like the smaller, lighter version of Plotly. It gives you a little less customization by default, but it has it's quicker to use for most purposes. So we are going to be using that library. And we're going to be using Pandas library that's that's basically allows you to mess around with um, tabular data. NumPy allows you to uh, work with um, uh, arrays and just lists of data, Pandas for tabular data. Okay, so let me quickly run these slides and these cells. And yeah, okay. And then we are going to get our data set from our cybers data, school, uh, data store. This data, this is a data store that we use in our lab. This has a bunch of our data. So I've selected a um, data set from the cybers data store. Let me just quickly download it and then we'll take a look at it. This shows the first 10 rows of the data, data, uh, data that we have. So you can see there's a bunch of data and this is this data has been gathered from the thermal sense thermal sensors. This is environmental data of the Maricopa Agriculture Center. So this data you can see it has a lot of a lot of um, columns that are related to environment. But uh, you can see that uh, when you are displaying it, uh, we are not able to see all the columns. And since to create effective visualizations, we need to have a good sense of data we're going to be listing our columns as well. So here's the list of all the columns. A lot of them are explanatory, but I'm going to explain to you some um, some of the interesting things that you might not, might not be aware of. So species, experiment, treatment, self-explanatory. But ROI temp is basically plant-specific temperatures. You have a 10 by 10 pixel area of a particular plant in the field. And you uh, and this is the temperature of that particular plant um, on the particular day, uh, particular time in the in the data set. Then there's the mean temperature of the entire canopy, the median temperature, the first quartile, third quartile, variance, standard deviation, sun direction, pretty understandable. So these this is our data, and we are going to be dealing with that. So that tells us what kind of data is numeric. So which kinds of which kinds of plot would be good for numeric data and what kind of data are not numeric? So how can we visualize non-numeric data? So let me let us first go with the basics. First, we have bar charts. So let me quickly run this there. So bar charts, you can see I'm plotting the bar charts, segmenting plants on the basis of types. And that is what bar charts are normally used for. Bar charts are normally used for categorical data. So in cases when you can classify your data set into in different categories, you use bar charts. And it can tell you and your x-axis are basically normally the, your categories and your y-axis are basically a numerical data. Right now we have count, but it can be something different as well. So to call the bar chart, make a bar chart, you just call the bar function of the px library, the plotly express library. So you do a px dot bar calling the bar function. Then you specify your data set, your what's going to be on the x axis, what's the title of the bar chart. And you can 
just click it and, and do fig, fig dot show to visualize your, uh, make your bar chart. But in some scenarios, it might be important for you to add some more modifications to your, uh, do your bar chart. So for in, in for this instance, like if I didn't have this line, let me visualize it. There's gonna be a lot of, there's gonna be a blue background, which makes it difficult to visualize these, um, these plots. So I added this line to update the layout and make the background color white. That makes us makes the data uh, that makes the chart more readable and easier to understand. You can also customize a lot more stuff um, in your bar chart. But if you have want to have an idea of what things you can, uh, what additional things you can visual, uh, customize, you can just hover your uh, your cursor over the bar function, uh, which yeah, and it uh, okay one second yeah, and it maybe I'm not allowed to move to move this thing. Okay, let's not move this. Okay, and it's gonna tell you a lot about what things you can change. You can change the pattern shape that's inside the plots, inside the rectangles. You can change the color of the rectangles, have a mode, um, have or uh, change the opacity. You can change a lot of things. So it's really customizable. Um, plot plotly expressed by default adds these values, but you can always go around changing them based on your style or uh, based, based on your needs. Okay, now moving on from bar charts, we are gonna make violent plots. So violent plots are widely used in statistics for uh, uh, for charting out the distribution of data. So you can see and seeing which kind of, which, uh, seeing which, uh, which fields, uh, which uh, data points are, are the outliers. So you can see there are some outliers, outliers here, but most of our data is leaning towards, uh, is uh, right leaning. So it's leaning towards the higher values. You can, when you hover over it, you can see the median of the data, the first quarter and the third quartile. And you can also see the max value and the minimum value. This is very important to figure out which kind of, uh, what kind of um, statistical, uh, attributes would be suitable for judging a data, like whether a mean would be useful or median or mode, all kind of things. These kind of things are really useful in determining what kind of, um, how your data is and how it works. You can also draw a box plot with the violin. So let's see, how do we draw that? So we go here and we see, okay, is there a violin mode? No, we don't wanna do that. Uh, there's a custom data, there's points, there's title, there's width, there's a box. Hey, we can see the box plot, a uh, box field. So if we go here and type box equal to true, maybe that's yeah, box equal to okay. I forgot a comma here. We visualize that, then you will have also have a box plot overlaid with your violin plot. This box plot is useful for showing you the median and the interquartile range of the data, uh, which can be used to identify, identify uh, outliers, like I said before. So you can see, we'll see a lot of these, uh, these visuals in um, research papers. So now you know how to create them. So now we can go to scatter plots. So creating scatter plots up pretty useful and you are like you saw in the previous session it's used a lot in machine learning applications so right now i'm visualizing the wind velocity on the x axis and the y below and the relative humidity on the y, on the y axis so and the color of the points are determined by the temperature of the points so as you can see this tells us a lot about the data by just by looking at it you can see that the relative humidity is not really dependent on wind velocity. It kind of remains constant, but you can see as the wind velocity increases, sorry, the relative, uh, degree, uh, relative humidity is pretty low. Then you can see that the temperature is also higher than for most for our points. So that's a very interesting observation, which would be hard to visualize with, by just looking at the table here. So you can see that you can visualize grouped aggregate data, aggregated data by just um, having a scatter plot or uh, 
as we can see later, a scatter plot matrix. So any questions right now, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Okay, let's move on. So now next thing I scatter plot matrix matrix or a pair plot. So what it does is that it does it create it plots all of these attributes that we are specifying about um, amongst each other. Okay, so let me quickly run this code. So you can see that we were using the scatter matrix uh, function. We were able to plot mean with all the different with itself and all the other attributes and same for all the other things that we selected. We selected these things because um, these are numeric data. If we have a data, uh, if we had a data field like which doesn't have numeric values in it, then we, we won't be able to visualize it using scatter matrix. It's gonna give you an error. But if you have numeric data, this kind of plot gives you an idea about what, about the relation between two different fields. So you can see that this time seems to exist some relation between temperature and relative humidity. So maybe you can you can think about which um, creating a model, a linear model or regression model or neural network that can be used to pre uh, predict the temperature using the relative humidity. Once you get rid of the outliers, so yeah, it's pretty useful for machine learning with, uh, purposes. If you are going to do some machine learning in future. I'm pretty sure your first step is gonna be visualizing, creating a pair plot for all your data field, data attributes. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the second section of this module. Now we are gonna be making some plant, plant science specific visuals, and which are basically gonna be the 3D plant data visualization that comes from the 3D data. And it's gonna be a map box, map plot, okay? So let me quickly run this because it takes a long time to install. So whenever you want to run any command line prompts in uh, in Colab, you basically have put up uh, an exclamation mark before it. So I'm using the pip module, which is a Python uh, installer module to install Open3D. You might be wondering why are we installing Open3D? So let us just go there. It's a tool for using 3D uh, for dealing with 3D data of all kinds, point clouds, every kind of other 3D data, you can go to its um, documentation and you can see it's a mod, it's a library for both C++ and Python, which are the two most popularly used um, languages for dealing with 3D information. It can be used for creating 3D, 3D data structures, 3D data processing algorithms. It can be used for 3D data visualization, which you might be wondering then why are we using Plotly for visualizing, visualizing 3D data? It's just that Plotly is a more generic, um, it's a more generic approach to visualizing things. Open3D gives you a lot of, um, um, gives you a lot of, um, I guess, independence. Like you can uh, figure out the intensity, the light, uh, how it's falling on your um, point cloud, but you normally don't really need those things. You don't need to have, uh, when you're visualizing plant data, you don't really need to have, um, in, uh, have that kind of independence. So what you can do is you can, you, you can is a plot, plot is like a one-stop solution for all kinds of data. So you can just simply use Plotly to visualize 3D data as well. So this documentation is pretty good. I've used it multiple times before. So you can always come here and look at it. It's easy enough to install, like you can see. So you can install this on your computer when you're dealing with 3D data in future. So let's get in back to the notebook. Let's hope it has been completed. Okay, it's been done. So yeah, so I basically downloaded the open 3d module and uh and i'm going to be including it in my code as o3d it's easier to write than open 3d every time so i'm just gonna add it as uh, add an alias here now we when we move on i'm going to import two more uh, modules as well we're gonna have the request module for downloading stuff, downloading our data from the internet. It's all again, it's gonna be in the 
uh, mean the uh, cyber data store. But since we are not using pandas to read the CSV directly from a URL, we are just gonna be getting the data using the request uh, request module, and we're gonna be using NumPy again. NumPy is like I said, is used for dealing with array arrays of data. Our uh, 3D data, uh, the point cloud data are basically a bunch of arrays. Um, so we're going to be using NumPy to, to manipulate that data. So let us, let me quickly download, import them. So, yep. Okay. Now in this box, you gonna you are seeing that I'm downloading a 3D point cloud from our cybers the data store using the request module. Then I'm going to store it locally on my, on the Google, on Google Colab. And then I'm going to read the point cloud using open 3D. And I'm doing something called voxel down sampling. So you might be wondering what is voxel down sampling? First, let me run this program and then we'll see. So voxel down sampling is basically a compression technique for compressing point clouds. So voxels are basically what pixels are for 2D data. Voxels are 3D versions of pixels. They are like small cubes. So we can use, uh, we can use, we can compress down those voxels and use um, just one, the average of a voxel to represent the data. So this does uniform compression of the data of point cloud data. In point clouds, we can have millions of points sometimes for bigger point clouds. So down sampling helps us to deal with it and uh, apply transformations to it easily without having to um, wait for hours and hours at times. So we that's why I was uh, down sampling it using Open3D. And now we, we can see, and this tells us the voxel size. This I think is in meters, but you can always double check. Uh, this is a, like a normal value that you normally go for, for when you are down sampling. We can go from 0, 0.00. To, uh, not 0 0.00, 0 0.001 to 0 0.005. That's like the standard. I'm going with 0 0.002. You can always modify it based on your data. Now we're gonna be sending and modifying our data to make it fit for visualizing. So our data, if you can look at, if you look at it, it is pretty difficult. It would be pretty difficult to visualize it because it's um it's so big. So what we can do to make it manageable and easier to visualize that we can subtract the mean of the data of the X and the Y offsets. You can see the Z offsets. We don't need to, sub, uh, we don't need to have a Z offset, offset because it's kind of small. We don't need to worry about it. But these two fields, the X and the Y, those are pretty big. So we, what we can do is just simply sub, subtract the mean from it, which would make it make the data more manageable and usable. And you can see that we have 110,000, okay, sorry, 1 million points. So if we, after downsampling, if we had not downsampled it, then you can imagine that it would be like around 5 million points. If I can just get rid of this thing for a second and see, okay, yeah. So we have got around 5 million points here, 5.3 million points. That's a lot of points to visualize. And with the limited resources of Colab, that's pretty much impossible. So we need to downsample it. Okay, let me re execute those two blocks and done. Okay, now we're gonna be visualizing it. So here we are defining our own color scale. While defining our color scale, it needs to be, it's important to make sure that it's relevant to your data set and it is accessible. We have a bunch of inbuilt data, plotly data color scales. You can simply go and see plotly color scales, easy to see. And there are a bunch of plotly color scales that you can use from scratch. I went with a custom one because of the sake of the workshop and to so show you how to make one. But you can go with the color um, in inbuilt or a already existing color scale. You can change the, you can see, there are basically broadly three types of color scales. One's the categorical color scale, the other one's the sequential color scale, and the third one's the um, diverging one. There's also a fourth one that you can sometimes use that cyclical data color scales. So we're gonna take a look at the inbuilt versions for all of them. So first, if you go to the discrete color scales, 
you can see that for discrete data, like for bar charts or categories or the data that you saw at the beginning of the workshop where I saw display, where I showed you how good, um, good visuals differ from bad visuals. You can see for such kind of data, you can have um, categorical color scales. So that where there's not really a relation between different categories, for sequential color scales, like uh, when you have to show temperature or something like that, then you need to be using sequential colors. Uh, for you need to be using sequential color scales to show sequential data. So this would be good thing for temperature. This is normally used for a lot for temperature purposes. You can see it all over the place. And for diverging color scales are like sequential color scales, but you also give importance to the middle values. So you can see the white strip here. So when you want to demarcate the mid midpoint of the data from the extremes, you need to be using diverging color scales. And the cyclical ones are used for things like time. So basically when data is cyclical, you use cyclical data uh, color scales. So the differences between them are minute, but it is important. And if you want to create a good visual, you need to be aware of which color scales you're using. You also need to be, make, make, be making sure that you use color scales that's going to be effective for a bunch of people, not just a small group. So we need to keep things like color blindness in mind when you're choosing appropriate color scale. Okay, right now I'm just going with a plant -tease color scale. So the zero and Z axis, the base level, the ground is sandy brown. Then we have lime green and the top is gonna be green. So let me quickly visualize it. And then I'll explain to you the function call. Okay, it takes a little time because it's a one million, it's one million points. It takes some time to visualize, but it does do it eventually. So any questions right now? Okay, please feel free to ask questions if you have. So you can see our 3D data being visualized. So by interactive, you can um, uh, you can click download the plots as PNGs. You can download them as PNGs. You can move around. Uh, you can what's happening? Okay, yeah. So once again, so my computer hang up on me. Yeah. So yeah, you can see it's downloading. You can move around, you can zoom in, you can zoom out with your in your plant clouds. You can zoom in and zoom out. And this is this data has been captured for a sorghum plant using our 3D sensors in our Maricopa Agriculture Center. So you can see how useful it can be for visualizing 3D data. And it is pretty easy to fall, uh, easy to call. You just make a data frame, a pandas data frame that I like, like I did here which has X, a column for X, a column for Y, and a column for Z axis. And you specify what, which columns for which axis, X, Y, Z, I'm specifying that. How you're gonna be defining the color, which I'm specifying that it's going to be based on the Z column of the data frame, not the Z axis, uh, which are the same in this scenario, but sometimes it can be different. So you have to keep that in mind. And I'm defining the color scale that we want to be using. It's a continuous color scale. That's a sequential color scale. And I'm using the color scale that I defined here. And basically, I'm here I'm uh, this, um, defining the size of the dots that you're gonna be visualizing. So that's, I chose went with 1.5. You can go with something smaller, something bigger, depends on your needs and your, which on your and your design that you have in mind. So that's it for three D data. Now we're gonna move to geospatial data. Uh, let me close this thing. And for geospatial data, again, we're gonna download um, data that has been captured from a three D scanner in the in the in the gantry in the Maricopa Agriculture Center. We're gonna be downloading it, but this time it's gonna be for lettuce. So let us quickly download it and we're gonna use it again, same thing as the 3D data, but just this time we're gonna be reading it as a CSV. So, and uh, it's, this is our basic data. This is different from our thermal data. 
because it has been captured from the 3D sensor. We don't really care a lot about these fields in for the purpose of visualization, but you can, and you can change visualize these fields as well. So now, uh, now that we have our data, we can create a map box with it. So map box is a private software. You need to have a key for it. It's a paid software. What you can see right now, I have my key stored here securely on Colab, but you can generate your own key. It's pretty simple to generate. You just simply Google Mapbox API, API key generation. It's going to ask you to make your account and then you can generate your own API key. I'm using mine here. You can put when you, when you generate your own API key, you can put it here and it's going to help you create, make the Mapbox. So, we are going to set the Mapbox access token or the API key, which is helps us interact with the soft Mapbox uh, software. We're going to set that. And this is just setting, getting my data key from the Google Colab. Um, you, when you are going to be using app, having your own API key, it's going to be something like uh, dot, it's going to be in JWT format. So it's something like this. Okay. So right now I'm going to be using mine. So then you can visualize a scatter map box by calling, like we, we have been doing the entire workshop. You can simply call a, a function, an inbuilt function the Python, uh, in the Plotly library, and that's gonna be pretty straightforward. You're gonna feed in your data frame, which is has our data, which we downloaded from Cybos. And we are gonna specify which columns are gonna be the latitude, which columns are going to be the longitude. So in our data, you can see it's these two columns. So these two columns we have to specify, and then we have to specify the color of the points that we're going to be visualizing. So what, what field in the data is going to be used for visualizing the color? So let me quickly first make this. And then I'll talk to you about other things. So I'm going with opacity one, and this opacity is the opacity of the points. You can choose a value from zero to one. I'm going with totally non-see-through points. You can make it a little bit see-through if you can have if you have overlapping points for your data. I'm going with the satellite map uh, map box style. If you don't have if you don't specify this field, then you can then you you'll get the normal general Google Maps uh, Google Maps look, which is like like a like a classic maps look you can go with that or you can go with the classic uh you can go with the satellite way of looking at um looking at field this is our maricopa agricultural center you can see all the points have been um colored according to the genotype of the plant that they are representing so when one when you hover over these points that's what i mean what we mean by interactivity when you hover over these points you can specify the data that you want to be seeing so right now I specified that I want to be seeing the latitude, longitude, genotype, and the plant name. But you can always go around and change those fields or maybe not have any fields at all. It's up to you. And that's the beauty of Plotly. You can make a lot of customizations without doing a lot of changes in the code. So you can see we have a lot of border plants that's used for segmenting plants on the basis of the treatment that they are receiving. And that's pretty much it. You can zoom in, zoom out. I specified the the initial zoom of 16.6 that was based on the map that I was plotting. I can change that number, but I went to 16.6 based on the data. And that's the most important thing that you need to take away from the workshop. You need to fully understand your data before you visualize it. And that's going to give you the best results. So I understood my data and that's why I chose to make the decisions that I made but these decisions can be different based on different kinds of data. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the visualization section of the workshop. I have a few references for you. So this is a YouTube, this, link, this is a YouTube tutorial that I followed when I was learning about Plotly a couple of years ago. It's pretty concise. It also has a link to a GitHub notebook that you can go and look at. So it's pretty useful. The plot, Plotly's um, manual that I showed at the beginning of the workshop, it has a link, it has, it is useful in, in, in its own. 
you don't really need to go to YouTube now to um, learn more about Plotly. You can just go to its manual and it would give you a lot of idea about what things you can visualize and what things you can do with Plotly. And there are some alternatives to Plotly as well that are also very widely used. So Matplotlib is, I think, the most popular one. It offers extensive customization, but it also demands a lot more code. And you cannot really easily create interactive visuals with it. C1 simplifies statistical plots. It's used for a lot in statistics, and it has built-in themes. And our plot that I was demonstrating the work in the workshop, that's used for creating dynamic and interactive visuals. That's its forte or its USP. And that's it for today. Hope you guys learned something. It, and thank you. All right, so thank you everyone for uh, making it to this session. It seems like we're gonna finish uh, a bit early today, uh, but we will follow up regarding all of the uh, code that was viewed here. Um, and in preparation for tomorrow's session, you can start taking a look at the code a little bit early since we're done a little uh, earlier today uh, for that third and final session. That third and final session would deal with uh, applying all of the computational toolkit that you've learned thus far into the realm of plant phenotyping. So tomorrow we'll be looking a little bit close, uh, having a closer look at object detection using machine learning and RGB images, and also using three-dimensional point cloud data that a DTS showed today and doing some machine learning on that as well. So feel free to stay on and ask any questions uh, in the remaining time. And thank you all for being here today. Hi, so uh, I do have a question. So can I go ahead or you want me to put it in the chat? No, feel free to, to, to ask your question. Okay, yeah, so first of all, thank you all the presenters for precisely presenting so many, so many things. So I, I'm curious about um, when you extracted the values from your uh, uh, view, uh, flyer view pro thermal camera, and you also incorporate a lot of different data like air temperature, humidity, precipitation. So I'm wondering, did you merge like the thermal sensor data with the environmental data and then you incorporate together? Like yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so yes, we do uh, get environmental data uh, on the farm using the Arizona Meteorological Network. So they collect uh, meteorological data on an hourly and sometimes on a minute basis. Um, using the information at the time of the scanning by the big gantry robot that we have, each uh, data collection point has a timestamp associated. So we then basically associate that timestamp for a measurement to the timestamp from the Arizona Meteorological Network. We pair those two up, and that way we have the canopy temperature for a given plant, the timestamp, and then the environmental information that's associated with that timestamp and that measurement. So, oh, I mean, uh, uh, that uh, is streaming that process like matching the time point between two different platform that is how uh, how efficient like is it something you do it with uh, like few lines of code or yeah great question as well um and that it depends on the data so since we have the arizona Meteor meteorological network here um, it's a little bit simpler, right, because we know the location where it's at, we know the time, we know the format of the data. So for our purposes, it's, it's a rather simple uh, script that can be run to do that merging. Uh, the most important part of that is making sure that the timestamp that you're associating with the measurement, right, a single canopy temperature is accurate. So the majority of our code is kind of centered around that, making sure that we have an accurate timestamp for each plant. And then at that point, it's only like a few lines of code, maybe two or three, to do the actual combination with the environmental data coming from azimuth. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I'm just making sure I'm not taking too much of the participants' time. No, feel free to do so. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so I'll go a little bit further. So I'm I'm at Kansas State University. I'm a postdoctoral scientist, and I'm doing a similar type of research. So we 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 have a couple now challenges in the way we proceed. So we flew a couple different times. We have multiple fields, and we extracted the canopy temperature. And we, we noticed that um, the canopy temperature varies a lot in different time points, even though the weather data is not that variable. And we also noticed that the, the plot polygons have a little bit different size and the bare soil also impact the canopy temperature. So um, I'm wondering, did you notice similar type of challenges or just making it precise? You, you mentioned, I, I asked a question in the chat, you mentioned that the size of the plants have an impact on the canopy temperature and you suggested using it as a covariate. So did you do some of those and it, did you uh, find the confounding get corrected or like what is your suggestions? Yeah, so one of the things that I suggest taking a look at in terms of, you know, the variability in canopy temperatures, but not the change in uh, environmental association, that could be due to, uh, for example, pixel mixture. So, uh, you know, when we're collecting imagery, uh, we may have an individual pixel that may actually include information from both the plant temperature and the soil temperature. So this could really affect our you know, calculation of canopy temperature. And oftentimes this is due to you know, issues or limitations within our uh, segmentation, right? So oftentimes with thermal imagery, we want to determine the plant's canopy temperature and then the soil temperature. And we want to kind of like separate those two because we're only interested in the plant. But however, that plant cluster can actually contain those mixture pixels, which can seem to cause variability in our data. Um, so that's what I would recommend is to take a closer look at the approach being taken to do the segmentation between plant and soil pixels, uh, because oftentimes this could be due to a mixture of pixels uh, driving your distribution one way or another there. Uh, so ju just to update, like we, we mask soil and we remove the soil from the background. We also remove the shadow. Yeah, still we are... But, but yeah, thank you for your wonderful presentation and very good insights. Appreciate it. Thank you. If so I'll take one more question. Say, so, yeah, I, I noticed uh, many of you are using frequently using Google Colab. So are you using the free version or you also uh, have some paid monthly uh, paid version of Google Colab and how, how does that works? So I am aware that there is a paid version oftentimes when uh, people need more resources. For example, they will pay for the subscription. For our purposes, we tend to stick with the uh, free version when we're giving workshops and stuff uh, because that gives you just enough computational resources to be able to run your code. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be actually running some machine learning models and you can run those in the free version of, of Google Colab. Um, however, keep in mind that you know, when applying machine learning to a larger scale, um, you're oftentimes not going to be using Google Colab. And at that point, we look towards high performance computing, cloud computing, um, all of which are outside of the realm of Google Colabs. Uh, but for the purposes of workshops and you know, developing some code, uh, Google Colab is great. Uh, even just a free version can get you access to GPU nodes or graphics processing units uh, to do a lot of your model training and model deployment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again.
But you know, with that said, every tool, every computational tool has its limitations. Um, you know, and uh, running Google Colab is great, but you know, oftentimes the issue there can be you know the computational resources that you need, like GPUs, or the storage space limitations as well. So with machine learning, we're oftentimes dealing with thousands of images, thousands of point clouds. Um, that can cause a real bottleneck uh, when trying to do something within a Google Colab, uh, just because you might not have all of the gigabytes of storage uh, that are necessary to actually store your data during the development of your models, for example. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying, like, we have the graphics card, NVIDIA, and we have supercomputing platform. But the problem here, uh, installing the necessary packages from the Python or Ultralytics. So that's kind of bottleneck. In Google Colab, those are very handy. They get installed very easy. So yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, we'll, we'll check with you guys for some of the troubleshoot uh, if your time permits later on down the road. Definitely, yeah. And, but, uh... but, but this is very eye-opening and a spirited speaker we got. Truly appreciate. Thank you. I think I see another question. Let's see, can we take drone videos? Um, in what sense, can you provide some context just to make sure that I answer your question correctly? Inside, uh, this is Dr. Saima Kuru. Uh, my question is that, like uh, in uh, the agriculture sector, if we are doing remote sensing and we are deploying drones in the farming, uh, artificial intelligence farming uh, setup, so can can we extract that drone videos into the uh, Python and? Uh, and make our uh, processing or calculation on that? Is it possible? Thank you. Yeah, that is a great question. And thank you for the, uh, the additional uh, context there. So uh, oftentimes with thermal drones, um, they tend to capture, like you mentioned, video, right? And from that video, uh, we have to extract tiles or single images that can be then be used uh, for orthomosaicing or uh, photogrammetry, for example. So that process can be done in Python. Um, additionally, there are oftentimes tools that are provided by the camera manufacturer to kind of do that conversion from video into stills or image captures. Um, and that is a big prerequisite there for uh, image stitching uh, using Pix4D or any of the other software like Agisoft uh, and things of that nature. Uh, because video, right, uh, is a lot more difficult to deal with. It's not geo-referenced. So as the video is playing, you don't know where you're at in a particular point in space. Uh, whereas with an image, you can tag on the geographical coordinates for that particular image. Um, so although video can be captured in agricultural fields, you probably want to convert that over to an image just so that you can have that geospatial uh, information together with that information. Thank you so much. Great, great answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw it in the yeah. chat or yeah. unmute yourself. Excuse me? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I would like to know if, do you know a methodology for calibration those image? The, I mean, the thermal image? Thank you. So you mentioned calibrations, and that is a very important process, um, you know, uh, for thermal imagery. You want to make sure that whatever information you are extracting, uh, you know, is accurate. And I see that Jeffrey is still on the call, and I will let him, uh, as the engineer, give a bit more context as to how we do that, both in the gantry data uh, as well as uh, drone imagery. Jeffrey? Hey there. Uh, yeah, so to calibrate our thermal imagers, we ended up doing a quite involved process. Uh, you end up getting some changes in your thermal measurements based on the temperature of the sensor, the environment, and what you're actually reading uh, on the detector itself. As we're getting raw outputs from our cameras and not any sort of post-processed uh, calibrated imagery from FLIR, 
what we do is we collect a series of measurements with a varying target temperature for a black body. Uh, we know the temperature of the black body. We know the temperature of the control environment room that we captured in. And we know the temperature of the camera. With that, we're able to generate some curves, uh, fitting all that together with varying ambient and sensor temperature, target temperature, and to look at the digital number coming directly off the detector so that we can then interpolate at each ambient temperature for a given value on our detector, what temperature are we actually going to be seeing? Okay, thank you. So I, I understand. So do you are looking for like a formula or like a, I mean, like a linear model topic between the the black body uh, temperature and the digital numbers, right? Yes. Uh, so we use the digital number uh, and the ambient temperature. We calibrated that against a black body target so that we yeah. know what target temperature we see for a given digital number at a given ambient temperature. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Uh, and did, did you, how did you do, uh, how did you do, did, uh, sorry, and, uh, did you use Python or how did you, R or what kind of software did you do? Uh, I did this manually in MATLAB. Okay. Uh, but okay. you could easily use one of the other softwares for it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. I'd like to make one final call for questions. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like or put it in chat. Um, I think we'll wait about one more minute. Um, and if there are no further questions, then um, we will close for the day. And we will see um, some of you back tomorrow. Okay, seeing and hearing no further questions, we will go ahead and end it here. Um, again, same time tomorrow. Um, it will be the same place. Um, if you're on YouTube, um, that um, landing page will actually change. But again, we will have that available on the HTTPI a website on this event webpage um, so that it's easily accessible along with the um, workbook that has been um, referred to multiple times throughout um, these last two sessions uh, to make sure everyone um, has the instructions that they need so that they can follow along. All right, thank you to presenters. Thank you to our audience um, and we'll hopefully see you tomorrow. <laughs>